Good morning. Thank you for tuning into the Government of this Land Labrador's announcement. I'm Tina Coffey with the Department of Education, and I am the moderator for today's event. Joining us today are the Honorable Tom Osborne, Minister of Education, and Tony Stack, CEO and Director of Education for the Newfoundland and Labrador School District. Please stand by. Our event is ready to begin. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us to discuss uh, education in Alert Level 5. With the recent news of COVID-19 variant in Newfoundland and Labrador, some immediate changes were required. This move in Alert Levels prompted us to move K-12 classes from in-person instruction to online. Obviously, this is a significant shift and we fully anticipate that there may be some bumps in the road in the early days of this transition. However, we have received positive feedback from the first days of virtual learning in the St. John's metro area. So it is a positive development that we hope carries through to all regions. We've learned a lot from the unexpected school shutdown in 2020. And before this school year started, all schools in the province were required to develop online learning plans. These plans included extensive professional learning around a host of topics related to online learning. Students and teachers have also gained familiarity with Go the Google platform with a particular emphasis on Google Meet and Google Classroom this year. We've received numerous questions about devices, so we wanted to clear up some of those questions. First and foremost, the ability to deliver online learning is not dependent on the delivery of new Chromebooks to any of these schools. Most personal devices such as laptops, tablets, desktop computers, and smartphones can be used for online learning. Most personal devices that families have available in their homes can be used for accessing online learning. As part of the online learning plans, all schools have done work over the past number of months to determine if there are any students in the school communities who do not have personal devices in their homes that will work for online learning. Many schools in the province have an inventory of extra devices available that can be loaned to these students to fill the gaps. And in many cases, this has already been done. We expect every student in the region will have access to the necessary technology for online learning. We've received several questions about the Chromebook order that was announced last summer. So I wanted to provide an update on that. The district is in the process of formatting a large quantity of Chromebooks, which will be distributed on a priority basis to those families who don't have their own devices available. We are also expecting another order of more than 10,000 devices within the next week or two. As more shipments come in, we will continue to distribute them. We anticipated delivery of Chromebooks last year. However, the reality is national and global demand is far outstripping availability of both devices and components. Production was also affected due to the global effects of the pandemic. The order that we made last July was the third largest order of any jurisdiction in Canada. While we await the arrival of the remainder of Chromebooks, we believe we have enough devices available for every grade seven to 12 student in the province who indicated that they do not have their own compatible device. We also want to note that while the purchase of Chromebooks was triggered in response to the pandemic, once all of these devices are available, they will also support the important shift in education towards e-learning 
and Google Classroom applications generally. The growth of online learning through the first wave of the pandemic has been incorporated into most teachers' daily practices, even when in-school instruction is happening and is likely the way of the future for education. We want to foster the technological prowess of this generation, and we believe that this will support our future technology workforce in this province. We also recognize that internet connectivity can be a challenge, as it was a challenge that arose during the suspension of classes last year. To address this situation, in May of 2020, the English School District distributed MiFi devices to the majority of homes with identified internet connectivity issues. The Francophone School District had far fewer students in that situation but they also took measures to ensure connectivity for any families who identified issues. Any family who believes that they are not on the existing lists regarding devices or connectivity who believe they should be are encouraged to reach out to the school administrators who will work with them with the district to find solutions. Regarding childcare, and before I hand it over to Mr. Stack, I wanted to touch base briefly on the news that we put out yesterday regarding regulated childcare services. In consultation with public health, a decision was made to allow regulated childcare services to remain open during Alert Level 5. However, the recommendation is that regulated childcare services provide service to the children of existing clients who are required to leave their home and report to their place of work. We believe that this will lessen attendance while also ensuring that the essential workers can continue their vital roles at this time without losing access to childcare. While we believe that this will lessen attendance at childcare services, we do not want to cause economic hardship for these businesses. For the duration of Alert Level 5 restrictions, we are also taking additional steps to recognize the needs of parents and the operational realities of regulated child care operators. To that end, parents whose children do not attend their normal regulated child care center during this period will not be required to pay for days they do not attend. Furthermore, they will not lose their spot. All regulated child care operators on the operating grant program that remain operational will continue to receive their full regular funding regardless of attendance levels. In closing, we have learned a lot since last year, but we anticipate that this shift, that, uh, sorry, that this is a shift for everyone in the school and in early learning education communities. <coughs> I do want to express my gratitude for the professionalism and the commitment to continued student learning and support from our educators and our early childhood educators at this difficult time. We have two priorities in everything we do, student safety and student learning. And with that, I will ask Mr. Stack to provide remarks. Thank you, Minister. This past week has certainly shown us how quickly things can change when dealing with COVID-19. But we have a plan, and it's a good plan. We just had to adjust it to a new reality, the reality being a return to alert level five throughout the province and the emergence of the COVID-19 variant. The good news, as Minister Osborne noted, is that we're in a much better place than we were last spring. Teachers have the technology and the training to deliver online learning. We have district personnel ready, willing, and able to support this and assist where necessary. For St. John's Metro Schools, which were the first to suspend in-class instruction last week, high school and intermediate schools have already begun implementing online classes. Primary and elementary grades begin online classes today, and we are aware that some already started last week. With respect to the remainder of the Avalon, excluding Metro, as previously announced, high school and intermediate online classes begin today. 
For primary and elementary classes, they will begin no later than tomorrow, Tuesday, February 16th. Regarding the rest of the province, Central, Western, and Labrador teaching staff will begin online instruction as follows. High school and intermediate grades begin online classes no later than Wednesday, February 17th. Primary and elementary grades begin online classes no later than Thursday, February 18th. With respect to teachers, the provincial government has deemed the provision of education to be an essential service. Teachers are being encouraged to work from home wherever possible. We had hoped the majority could work from their classrooms, but given the move to alert level five, with people encouraged to remain at home if they can, we have sent the message to our teaching staff that it would be preferred if they could work from home. If a teacher cannot work from home for any number of reasons, they will be permitted to access their classrooms in order to work. We know there will be challenges. We know families have individual circumstances which raise questions and concerns. We may not have immediate solution to every individual's issue in the early days, but we are committed to working through these issues as quickly as possible. I ask that everyone be patient and understanding as school and district personnel attempt to deal with any exceptional circumstances. Regarding students with complex needs, another important plan that we've had to change for now due to the sudden move to Alert 5 and the COVID-19 variant is the plan to have students with complex needs in the school environment with the support teams in place. For now, at least this week, and perhaps for the entire two week break, uh, circuit breaker period, these students uh, will have no in school learning opportunities. But schools will be in contact with families later this week to discuss virtual programming and services. That information, which may vary on a school by school basis or case by case basis, will be provided to families as information becomes available. Again, we're begging patience. We will get through this with your cooperation and understanding. Meanwhile, we will work with the Chief Medical Officer Health and public health officials, which we've done closely all along in the various regions of the province and adhere to the recommendations and advice provided, which as you've seen over the past week is ever evolving and can be adjusted as necessary from day to day or even hour to hour. That's our new reality. So we must all adapt and adjust as required. I will take this opportunity to thank our district staff and school leadership teams for their efforts over these past few days. We've already seen excellent examples of how teachers in the Avalon region quickly pivoted to online instruction last week. I have every confidence that our professional teaching staff in the rest of the province will be just as nimble in making the transition over the next few days. Thank you. Thank you, Minister and Tony. Um, for the benefit of our speakers, there are five reporters registered for today's announcement. The question and answer session will be conduct conducted in one round, where each reporter will have the opportunity to ask two questions and one follow-up. Following this, I will ask each reporter if they have any final questions. I ask that you keep your phones muted until it is your turn to speak. Our first questions are from Cecil here, CBC News. Hi, good morning. Uh, first question is for uh, Minister Osborne. Uh, Minister Osborne, I, I just wanted to ask you about the, the Chromebook situation. Uh, when you mentioned 10,000 should be here in a week or two, does that mean 20,000 have already arrived? And I think part of the order was also 5,100 laptops. What's the status of those as well? I'll, uh, I'll ask Tony to clarify, uh, but I believe all laptops have arrived, and uh, I believe we've got uh, just over 2,000 uh, Chromebooks provided uh, with another 10,000 on, on the way, Tony? That's correct, Minister. Uh, just, just to clarify, and chunk this into three uh, different components of an answer. So all of the teachers in the province, 5,000 plus, have been provided uh, with a laptop. And okay. that, that took place uh, very early in the school year. Uh, with respect to the Chromebooks, there was an order, as the minister alluded to, of over 30,000 in July. Uh, to date, we've got uh, 1,500 that came in and were provided to the Labrador area. Another 500 
uh, are being configured to fill immediate gaps here now. Um, so we're expecting by the end of February a further 10,000, uh, and then they had to be configured. And then we're going to, we have a, a number of different uh, target dates that have been provided by the company Lenovo, uh, and they've assured it that they will meet these target dates of another additional couple of hundred in March, another 4,000 in mid-March, and another 7,000 odd by the end of March. So that'll bring the total to about 23,000 by the end of March, 23,600. And then there's still another 7,000 that would be fulfilled before the end of the school year. Um, so that was always um, a, a plan for Chromebooks for, for grades seven through 12. The issue of uh, devices in general in December, uh, actually last year, we went through a process where schools identified students in need. Parents self-identified they were in need. Uh, they weren't able to provide that device, so we reached out to those families and were able to, to do a, a very good job of uh, attending to that need, including the provision of MiFi. Um, in December, they went and did another round, and we have, of all the people who were surveyed at that point who self-identified as needing some form of a device, uh, we have enough on hand to meet that need. There, is, uh, there are some now new requests coming in, but I want to make sure we differentiate. Every student in the province, grades 7 to 12, will ultimately get a top-of-the-line, brand-new Lenovo, Lenovo uh, Chromebook. The ones that we have now on hand are not the Lenovo, Lenovo version. Uh, there are, we've got... Uh, a couple of thousand of those on hand for emergencies and so we you know if, if there is a parent out there who didn't identify in the previous two rounds uh, we can still look after your needs however uh, we're asking people to only identify if they absolutely need a device on the basis of need and we'll be able to get through this the, and then as we get additional devices the actual Chromebooks from the original order we'll be able to shift resources around the province so uh, really asking for everyone's cooperation in this. And I, uh, I'll direct the follow-up to you, Mr. Stack. Uh, how satisfied are you with the, with when I look at 1,500, uh, you know, 2,000 now, uh, based on an original order of 30,000, that doesn't seem a, like a whole lot to me. Uh, how could this have been avoided, I wonder? I, I, that's a very good question, Cease. Uh, when you place the order this far in advance, uh, we're dealing with the company, it's, it has to do with a, a worldwide shortage of microprocessors. Um, and they are prioritizing us, we've been assured of that. The microprocessors are in great demand all over the world. And uh, we got everything else. They could build the thing and send it, but microprocessors are kind of important. So uh, I'm not sure what we would have done, see, any different. Okay, I'll stop now. <laughs> uh, I'll uh, provide. Uh a remark as well to you on that, Cecil. Uh, I think it's important to reiterate uh, that any child, uh, every child, uh, will have access to online learning. Uh, it is not contingent or dependent on the Chromebooks. Chromebooks would be ideal, obviously. Uh, the English School District uh, and government, in good faith, had ordered the, uh, the Chromebooks well in advance with the understanding that uh, they would have been received last year, uh, but uh, I guess in part because of the pandemic and production, and in part because of the pandemic and a higher global demand, um, you know, we've had to, uh, to uh, obviously wait on the delivery of the Chromebooks, but there are enough resources uh, within the system uh, that online learning will continue. Good morning. Uh, I, I guess this question is for Minister uh, Osborne. Uh, well, I see that there's uh, the, the English school board is there, but in the province, there's also the French school board. I was wondering, uh, why aren't they there? Uh, the majority of the issues that have come forward have been uh, related to the English school district. Um, we've uh, been in uh, consultation with the head of the Francophone school district. Um, and I believe that uh, any issues that are ongoing uh, have been uh, 
addressed or in the process of being addressed by the Francophone School District, but the more majority of the, the outstanding questions and issues have been uh, related to the English School District. But the same resources, the same announcement that you did this morning, everything will still be accessible for the French School? Uh, yes. Uh, the, the Chromebooks will be provided to the Francophone School District as well. Um, and uh, uh, similarly, the, the MiFi uh, issues uh, were addressed uh, months ago uh, by both school districts. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Next, we have Brian Callahan with BOTM. Please go ahead. Good morning, Minister. Good morning, Mr. Sack. <coughs> um, I just want to clarify a couple of numbers. You mentioned that the, um, there were 30,000 Chromebooks ordered, ordered in July. Uh, can you just give me two numbers right now, uh, the number of devices or Chromebooks that you need and the number of Chromebooks right now that you have? So uh, I can answer that. As, as, we, uh, as I alluded to earlier, the, the issue of the provision of devices is really separate from Chromebooks. And Chromebooks would obviously have helped uh, if we had had them in for grade 7 to 12. But for every student in the province, uh, anything that was requested in just prior to the Christmas break, schools have on hand to, who have either distributed it or are in a position now to distribute. Um, since then, there are s several other individuals who have um, identified as needing a device. Uh, everybody will get a Chromebook eventually, but needing a device right now to, to access online learning, we have uh, several thousand. There are, I can give you a total here now, there are, uh, we'll have t 1,700 on hand to be, uh, to look after any additional needs that have been identified since uh, last year. Okay. Um, and when you say they're on hand, does that mean they're formatted, they're in the schools and the teachers have them, and, or the, the people who need them can have them right now? Yes, we can, we can push out. Uh, schools are doing this right now as we speak. We can push out uh, any additional needs. There are uh, on hand, we purchased an additional 689. The Department of Education, the Learning Resource uh, Center, LRDC, they uh, sourced us an additional 900. Now, they do have to be configured. Uh, we've secured an additional 100 from uh, computers for schools. So that's the 1,700 uh, roughly adding up that we have total on hand. Um, we are also going the extra step of uh, additional purchases from a local vendor, uh, 550 that we'll receive this week. And of course, they'll have to be reconfigured. Uh, so, you know, ultimately, the grand total. Uh, for interim support would be 2,239. Uh, so that's why I really want to emphasize it's only those families who are in uh, real need that, who, that cannot provide any devices at all that have self-identified since our first rounds of uh, looking for who needed devices. So it, it's, it's not in the thousands, but we do have the capability of, uh, of meeting that need. And if we got to go further afield, we will do though. Okay, thanks. And my follow-up, just briefly, could you tell me how many people you are aware <clears throat> of students do not have internet access? Well, last time uh, each school would have its own figures. The last time that we did this in the spring, it was roughly somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five percent um, that we were addressing back then. So I don't have totals right now. Uh, each school would would have that, and each school has identified if there's any additional requirement. And that's, that's why we sourced the additional 2,000. Right. And is there a solution to those people who do not have internet? As the minister referenced, uh, MiFi. If there's cell coverage, we can do MiFi. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Our next questions are from Jody Cook and TV News. Please go ahead. Good morning. I just wanted to touch base on the um, the the criteria for those who have complex needs. So you had indicated that there, there would very likely be a period of up to two weeks where there was just no learning happening whatsoever uh, and that the district would be calling those families. Can you clarify for us? Because we know that access to human, or access to education obviously is a basic human right. So 
how do we do this previously and how can we not do it now? So we, uh, we had a plan all along to address the, what, what's different this time is we re reached out to health. Uh, we want to confirm that the health and safety measures, such as the nature of the masks and different protocols, are confirmed by health before we bring any student into a building or any teacher who has an interactive student in the building. We want to make sure that the appropriate um, medical health advice is being followed. So that needs to be confirmed. That's going to take a few days. Obviously, we understand, uh, having worked around the clock with health, that they are intensely busy right now and dealing with the, the issue of the pandemic itself. Uh, those questions need to be clarified in order for us to confirm that things are safe to, to proceed. I don't think any parent or any teacher would, would, would want to be in a situation where we're putting people at risk. I would disagree with the notion that no learning would be occurring in that our very capable student support teams will be in touch with parents to discuss what can be done in a virtual sense uh, in terms of support uh, right now. Now, obviously, that looks different for every child and every family and every situation, but there will be outreach. And then as soon as we can clarify uh, if it's safe to bring students in contact with teachers in a building, then we'll do so. Thank you. Um, teachers ha have been reaching out, obviously, to news media, saying they continue to feel that they've not been consulted and their concerns around communications throughout this last year haven't been met. They say that they've been left in the dark and they're the only ones who can really help inform what's possible and what's not, but they're not being asked. Um, so these past few days with these new variables, uh, we have been in constant contact with the Newfoundland Labrador Teachers Association. We've had some very good dialogue, some very good uh, cooperation, and we've also uh, tweaked some of our correspondence and our procedures based on their input. Um, so we've had good dialogue there. Uh, with respect to some of the notices going out <laughs> late at night at midnight, that's because we've got district staff working that late uh, interfacing with our health partners. And when health information is clarified and presented to us, then we very quickly turn that around and issue uh, instructions to our teaching staff. Um, it's, uh, you know, obviously this is no, no plan survives first contact with reality. I'm fond of saying, and I, I, I've lived that. So um, anytime there's any kind of a tweak or a, a, a difference in procedure or this new variant has introduced new, new aspects, then we have to rethink where we are. And I think that's only prudent. And we, will, we do outreach to the association and, and uh, as well the other, the other uh, uh, labor groups that uh, are part of our uh, fraternity with, in education, like NAEP and CUPE. I'll add to that as well that uh, I've had uh, regular contact with the uh, leader of the uh, Newfoundland and Labrador Teachers Association um, and uh, been very responsive. Uh, anytime uh, there's been dialogue needed, uh, there hasn't been delay in, in responding. Um, we've had several very progressive uh, and productive discussions. Our next questions are from Andrew Robinson to Telegram. Please go ahead. Hello. Um, I'm wondering if uh, Mr. Stack could uh, elaborate a bit on um, NLESC's role in relation to schools setting up their own plan of action for how um, students' days will be planned. So the, the guidance from the uh, provincial government, good guidance that we received uh, in uh, September, has been amplified in our own plan. Uh, there have been some uh, timelines, some minimum timelines established. Uh, and you know, we'll, we'll see how this goes in early days. But right now, for example, in K to 6, uh, in K to 3, let's deal with primary, you're looking at uh, an hour a day so five hours a week as a minimum of uh, synchronous online activity. And uh, that's with the teacher. Now that, that, that could be in the morning, depending on how the school has it set up, and then another session in the afternoon with another group of children. Um, emphasis on numeracy and literacy. And then when you go up into grade four to six, that 
goes to 90 minutes per day uh, of synchronous activity. There's also um, uh, suggestions, activities will be um, put out there in, an, in what we call asynchronous manner, whereby for the remainder of the day, there are, there are activities that the children can do, albeit not online. Um, we have to also consider screen time uh, and the duration of that screen time, what's healthy for students. And then when we get into grades 7 to 12, it, it alters a little bit in that they follow their regular schedule. Now that doesn't mean they're online for 300 minutes a day. Uh, that would look like, uh, it could look like, for example, in a math period in the morning, first period, uh, you do 10 minutes of interface with the teacher and then the individuals go off uh, asynchronously, off screen, and do their own thing. Or it could be an uh, English language class where they break into groups within the, the Google Classroom and there's three or four of them together collaborating on, on some activity. Uh, so they follow their regular schedule through 7 to 12. Obviously, uh, we would anticipate that as the grades go up 7 to 12 that the, the students, depending on, on their age, will be able to uh, participate uh, more, uh, more screen time in a synchronous manner with their teacher if required. So, uh, you know, we're trusting the professional judgment of our teachers. We respect that and we have every confidence that they'll be able to manage within those parameters and, and deliver high quality education, albeit Nothing ever fully replaces face-to-face uh, -face instruction. Um, I know uh, early, a lot earlier um, the, the issue of child care uh, was touched upon. I wanted to ask about it specific to teachers who have children at home and are still expected to uh, teach from the work site. Um, uh, do you, do, do, Mr. Stack, do you feel this, uh, this situation has been more or less addressed, or is, are there still any kinks to be worked through there? Uh, you know, any time you have a situation where you have, have children and child care has altered, then people are going to have to work through different challenges. And, you know, we will, schools are very good at you know, having creative s solutions. Um, but ultimately, what we're saying is to teachers, um, you know, we had hoped that everyone could come in and work from the classroom that they're used to and have all their smart board and everything there. Given where we are with uh, the new variant, then the, the feeling was, uh, discussions with the, the preliminary discussions we did had with health, was it would be advisable for people to work from home if they could. Now, there's a number of different provisions there. Uh, you had to have, you know, you have, to, you have the ability to work from home. Now, they all have laptops, but you do need a secure space. Uh, there are privacy issues. Uh, you wouldn't want uh, you know, other, other people other than the teacher operating uh, with uh, confusion and disruptions. So if, if that can't occur, if you can't operate from home, and we think most people should be able to, but if they can't, then the schools are available uh, for teachers to access their classrooms. And if you, you know, ultimately, in order to have online learning, we need teachers. So if, if you can't do it from home and you can't do it from school, um, then there is no other provision. Uh, that's the only way the teachers are essential workers and we need them to be, to be doing their work. So um, that, that's where we are. Thank you, Andrew, and your response. For our final round, I will go through the Register of Media once where there will be an opportunity for one question Time. Your name is Paul. Cecil, here at CBC. Do you have a final question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, a question for uh, Mr. Stack uh, regarding uh, the readiness uh, of teachers today, this week. Um, we've heard from some teachers, Mr. Stack, who say uh, that other than some online introductory courses on how to uh, work your way through the uh, the interface, the Google interface, uh, there, there really hasn't been a whole lot of direction and guidance on actually uh, teaching online and delivering the curriculum in an effective manner. How do you respond to concerns expressed by some that we uh, are not ready for this? So uh, before the year start, we did a number of uh, health and safety protocols with teachers, but also uh, quite a bit of... Uh, professional learning around uh, virtual learning with teachers early in the year. 
in, uh, later in the fall, we put out uh, an ask to teachers Look, if you're still feeling like you um, need something additional, please let us know. So there were some 2,000 teachers that wanted a bit more training, so we organized release time for them, and we conducted that professional learning. I, I got to say, teachers have been really good at stepping up. A lot of uh, uh, online resources were made available that they accessed uh, on their own, um, offline, asynchronously, you know, during their preparation periods or or even in the evening. Uh, we had a lot of book studies and discussions, and teachers really stepped up. Now, if there's still some out there that uh, require additional learning, and look, we're always learning, then, then we will, uh, the, all they have to do is identify what those learning needs are to us, and we will address them. But uh, we're a long ways ahead of where we were last spring, uh, leaps and bounds, and I'll say it again, I'm really pleased with how teachers have stepped up, and I know, having seen a lot of correspondence in the last number of days, uh, people are jumping into this, a lot of enthusiasm around it, and really I think there's a, a strong desire to show what they can do, what they've learned and what they can do. And uh, my next question uh, is for both of you, I guess. When I think about way back in September, and the plan then for the successful return to school and the resources that were thrown at that. And I think now of the future and how do we put the children back to school uh, safely or safer than in light of what happened in Mount Pearl in the three high schools in Mount Pearl? I think. Uh, how do we return safely after this? Yeah, Cecil, I think. That will be in consultation with public health uh, and the chief medical officer of health. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, safety and learning are the, the two top priorities, as I've indicated earlier. Um, but the, the back-to-school plans um, outside of this variant uh, and the most recent, uh, you know, the, the, the most recent incident, uh, the guidance from the uh, Chief Medical Officer of Health and Public Health has guided us very well in, in the school year. Um, you know, obviously uh, any return to school and any modifications or, or any uh, changes in the way we operate will be guided by public health. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you sir. Thank you both. Jose Beck, CTV Radio Canada, do you have a final question? Uh, yes, actually, um, I was just wondering uh, why uh, why did you take the decision to keep the kindergartens open, and how will you assure that uh, it, it doesn't become a form of uh, transmission? I, sorry, I I didn't get that. Yes, so I was just wondering uh, why uh, are the kindergartens uh, still open, and how will you ensure that uh, it's not a form of uh, transmission? Why are the kindergartens still open? I'm, I, I'm not. I'm not getting. I'm not understanding the question. Yes. Yeah, so, so you just announced that the the uh, kindergarten, uh, the early childhood, uh, were were still open. So I was just wondering why That's and how will you ensure that. Uh, this is not a form of uh, that anything can transmit by by uh, this. Okay, sorry. At, uh, yeah, so kindergarten is not open. Early childhood um, education. Sorry, yeah, my mistake. Yeah, the early childhood. Yes. Yeah. So early childhood education. Um, uh, in it with with uh, discussion uh, or in discussion with public health uh, we we've made announcements um, last night uh, regarding early childhood education where we see that the number of um, attendance at early childhood education should be uh, significantly reduced than normal capacity um, and uh, it is to uh, alleviate uh, child care concerns, uh, early learning and child care concerns uh, for essential workers who are required to report to work. Um, uh, we need those essential workers at their workplaces and if they need uh, child care that should not be an impediment to them uh, reporting to work. 
Um, so there has to be balance. Obviously, public health and the chief medical officer of health uh, have provided some guidance to us on this, uh, and uh, it resulted in the announcement last night. Thank you, Jose. Brian Callahan, BOCM, do you have a final question? Yes, thanks. Have teachers been um, uh, advised to sort of temper their expectations, you know, with regard to work and tests and everything, given this shift here and the pivot and, and the learning curve for many, or even if it's not just the learning curve, the, uh, the different, um, you know, atmosphere they're in now? Yeah, uh, yeah I, you know, I think it's, it's pretty evident that um, we are very concerned with the emotional health uh, in addition to you know, the physical health of all of our students and teachers know that and understand that. Um, we've emphasized throughout this year the importance of relationships, uh, social emotional learning. Um, those are really key elements of uh, a well-rounded education in a modern context and in a context of a worldwide pandemic even more important. So while assessment continues, uh, teachers, uh, I know, will take a, um, a humanistic approach to dealing with their students. Uh, they really care for their students. They care for their learning and they care for their well-being. Uh, you know, we'll work, with, we'll work through individual issues. Uh, obviously, it's not the same. Things have changed. You know, we prepared for it and planned for it, but there's always elements, the human element that introduces itself uh, in these situations. And uh, assessment continues. But um, we will always have at the forefront um, the, the emotional well-being of students as well, their, their, their mental health, mental well-being, uh, as well as their learning needs um, to, to, as we go forward. And as a short follow-up, if, if you don't mind, um, with regard to the uh, children with complex needs, it seems, still seemed a bit vague to me, the, the comments about that earlier. Uh, can you give me some more clarity about how those uh, you know, the options that you're looking at and uh, what kind of communications you're having with those parents? Sure. So schools will reach out. Uh, you know, special services teams are working this week, and they will reach out to those individuals uh, who uh, we had always planned for them to be in the building. Uh, now, there were some parents that, uh, some family situations where e even though we'd planned for in the building, there was apprehension from the parent, parent side about the student uh, attending. So. There's always things that can be done in terms of outreach, but it depends on each and every situation for the child. Um, you know, we, 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 we want to maintain that connection to students and families. We want to be able to reach out to them um, and be mindful that everyone's context is different. So for now, it's a, a bit of a holding pattern on them being in school. That is ultimately our goal, but we've got to be sure that the health and safety measures are appropriate for teachers and students to be together in a building during a variant situation in a worldwide pandemic. Uh, that's, that's the new variable that's been introduced as the variant, so we just got to confirm that the health and safety measures are appropriate, and then we'll get back to the point where we can have those children who uh, cannot avail uh, completely of virtual uh, in, a, in a, an environment where they can uh, avail of learning services. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Jody Cook, NTV News, do you have a final question? Yeah, thanks. On the topic of evaluation, I know assessment's been touched on briefly, but if I could get a little more specific, um, we know that in uh, the spring of last year, there was a conversation about a, a, a formula for an evaluation plan and grading, and I, I'm going to be totally honest, I can't even remember what that formula was, but uh, is that being considered now and exactly how parents can ensure that their kids are going to be graded and what that's going to look like throughout the circuit breaker and potentially beyond? So last year, given the situation, and uh, it was uh, in incredibly um, difficult to navigate through in the early days, uh, and there was a lot of pressure on families and graduating students. We're in a, in a different environment, uh, and, and I respect that the, the government uh, of the province uh, cancelled public examinations last year. We also, uh, you know, in the, in the district, working with uh, the Department of Education, um, put in place uh, evaluation whereby whatever mark had been achieved to that point, um, if it was a passing grade, would be honoured 
through to the end of the year, and students had the opportunity, though, to improve the mark through assessments. So the difference this year is assessment is ongoing. Now, obviously, you have to ha have uh, soft eyes, if I can call it that, uh, on the challenges that, that students and families are facing, um, and teachers are very good at that. So it's a bit of a different context. Assessment is continuing, Al although um, I'm not speaking on for, for the, the government, but the, they also uh, this year suspended public examinations as well. So that, that assists and gives us some latitude to maneuver. Okay, thank you. And then uh, just my follow-up question, if I might. Um, we, no one really wants to approach this topic, but the reality is we were talking about this in the spring and the cancellation of the 2020 school year as well. This right now is being looked at as a circuit breaker. Last spring, you also started making a contingency plan that this could continue into the remainder of the school year, which it did. Are you there at this point right now also looking forward to, you know, God forbid, the end of the, the summer season or the end of the, the season? Uh, from a district perspective, we're prepared for online learning for as long as it has to go. Uh, but obviously the preferred would be to back, be back in class, uh, but that, that's contingent on whatever happens with the pandemic and the advice of public health. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Andrew Robinson with the Telegram. Do you have a final question? Um, kind of following up a bit on, on, on what Jody uh, asked about there. Um, now, seeing that, I guess there were lessons learned you know, from last spring's experience. Um, I'm wondering um, you know, what the expectations are in terms of you know, this current situation and what sort of outcomes, um, you know, uh, NLESD might be tracking and how it might uh, regroup after to, you know, assess what worked, what didn't work, what could they be tweaked, et cetera, et cetera? Well, look, uh, clearly, uh, this has been a learning experience, and we, can, we are a learning organization. We will adapt and overcome as required. Um, so, you know, we, we've done a lot of preparation around assessment, and we'll, we'll carry forward with that. But if there are aspects that have to alter in the best interest of learning and of students and of teachers, then we will do so. Um, we're, not, we're not fixed here in any way. Um, we, wanna, we wanna do as much uh, learning as possible and much uh, assessment as possible. Uh, and, and that'll carry forward. I have every belief that it will. But if there's things that we had to tweak, then we're prepared to do so. And uh, the, the actual experience will inform the practice. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you, everyone. Our time has ended. Uh, Minister, do you have any final comments? Just to uh, send out an appreciation to our educators, both in the early learning and in the uh, K-12 system, uh, for uh, putting our students first. Um, and I understand that this is a, a time where people are feeling anxiety. Uh, it, the situation has evolved and continues to evolve. Uh, and as it evolves, uh, we will respond uh, as uh, new information comes forward. Uh, but wishing everybody well, uh, please stay safe and, and follow the protocols set forward by the uh, Chief Medical Officer of Health. Tony Stack, do you have any final comments? I've seen a lot of teachers uh, use the hashtag better together and hashtag we got this. Uh, but stay safe, everyone. Be well. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, everyone. Take care and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Our smartphones. We use them to keep in touch, to play, and to work. Now, your smartphone can help you limit the spread of COVID-19. Someone can have COVID-19 and not know it. They can spread the disease before they have any symptoms. The Government of Canada has developed an app that will let you know if you may have been in contact with someone who has tested positive for COVID-19. The COVID Alert app creates a random code so that no one will know your name or your location. The app uses Bluetooth to exchange random codes with nearby phones. The code is a randomly generated string of digits and letters that changes every five minutes, so it cannot be used to identify you. The app does not have access to your name or address, or your phone's contacts, your location, or your health information. 
If someone you've encountered later tests positive for COVID-19 and uploads to the app a one-time key they received from their healthcare authority, you'll be notified that you may have been exposed. If you test positive for COVID-19, you can upload your one-time key from your healthcare authority. The app will then notify the people you've encountered without revealing your identity. You can then take steps to limit the spread of the disease. If you know you've been exposed, you should contact your local public health authority and follow their instructions. Using the app is one more thing we can all do to help limit the spread of COVID-19, in addition to washing our hands, keeping two meters apart, and wearing a non-medical mask or face covering when it's difficult to maintain physical distancing. You can do your part by downloading the app today and helping others use it too. The more people who use the app, the better we can contain COVID-19. Help protect yourself and your community. Download the COVID Alert app to help limit the spread of COVID-19. Go to the App Store or Google Play. Find out more at canada.ca slash coronavirus. A message from the Government of Canada.